Good afternoon. My name is Eula Taylor, and I'm the proud chair of the Department of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. And I'm really excited to participate in this campus conversation. October 3rd, 2020 marks the 150th anniversary of the UC Regents' unanimous approval of a resolution by Regent Samuel F. Butterworth. Quote, the young ladies be admitted into the university on equal terms in all respects with young men, end of quote. The first women were admitted to the university in 1872, and the first woman, Rosa Scribner, graduated with a bachelor's degree in agriculture in 1874. Since that time, hundreds of thousands of women have graduated from UC Berkeley, and thousands of staff, faculty, and friends of the campus have made contributions to our campus and beyond. Our 150 years of women at Berkeley celebration and history project has been remarkably successful in soliciting responses from various units and departments. To date, over 25 units have developed online sites discussing the history of women at Cal, and we are pleased to note that more are in the process of being made. I'd like to now introduce our panelists for today's conversation. Chancellor Carol Chris began her term as the 11th Chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley on July 1st, 2017. A celebrated scholar of Victorian literature, Chancellor Chris is well known as an advocate for, equ for quality, accessible public higher education, a proponent of the value of a broad education in the liberal arts and sciences, and a champion of women's issues and diversity on college campuses. Chancellor Chris spent more than three decades as a professor and administrator at UC Berkeley before serving as president of Smith College, one of the country's most distinguished liberal arts colleges from 2020 to 2013. She returned to Berkeley in January 2015 to direct the campus's Center for Studies in Higher Education and was appointed interim executive vice chancellor and provost in April 2016, before being named chancellor in March 2017. Our next panelist, Professor Emerita Catherine Gallagher, is a Berkeley alum, both graduate and undergraduate. She joined the English department faculty here in 1980 and was the Ida May and William Eggers chair when she retired in 2013. She is a member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and received NEH, ACLS and Guggenheim fellowships, as well as several residential fellowships. She was a founding member of the editorial board of the journal Representations and served as its co-editor for 10 years, helping to popularize a form of literary studies that was called New Historicisms in the 1980s. She wrote several books on British literature and cultural history, including one on 17th and 18th century women in the literary marketplace. Her latest book, telling it like it wasn't, The Counterfactual Imagination in History and Literature was published in 2018 and won the American Phys Philosophical Society's Jack Brazen's Prize for the year's best book in cultural history. Our third panelist is Sheila Humphreys, who is an Emerita Director of Diversity in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences in the College of engineering, where she remains actively involved. At Berkeley since 1977, Humphreys created academic and mentoring programs, both for women and underrepresented minorities to increase and sustain diversity from pre-college through graduate and re-entry levels. Her service on behalf of diversity has been recognized by President Obama in 2015, with the Presidential Award for Excellence in STEM Mentoring. 
the Computer Research Association Haberman Award and the Berkeley Citation. She continues as coach and advisor to first generation and underrepresented minority students at, in the Cal Nerds Program and the Black Engineering and Science Alumni at Cal. An alumni of Smith College, 1963, she earned a PhD from Tufts University in French literature in 1973. Now I would like each panelist to touch on why the 150 Women History Project is important. I'd like to begin with Chancellor Chris. Thank you, Eula. It's such a pleasure to talk about this project, which is so thrilling to me. Um, when the second wave of feminism started in the late 1960s and early 1970s, it was quickly recognized that the telling of women's history was absolutely critical to um, the, 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 the struggle for greater equity, that there was this effort, which was called herstory um, at the time, uh, to make women much more visible in history. And that's why this project is important to me at, um, at Berkeley, really at the University of California, is to make, first of all, this, um, this act of the regents visible, which was a pioneering act at the point that they admitted young women, young ladies on the same conditions as young men, um, but to make visible the extraordinary history of, of, of women at Berkeley. So uh, I, I think you don't know your history unless you make it visible in all of its diversity and all of its elements. That is so true. And if there was ever a time to know our history, it's 2020. Um, I like um, um, Professor Gallagher, if you could share some insights into some of the watershed moments for you and this pro um, during this project. Certainly, Eula, thank you so much for um, hosting this panel and thanks so much to the chancellor for, uh, for having the panel with us. Um, let me explain, first of all, what watershed moments are in a project. Very nice. Watershed moments refers to a series of articles that are on our website where we look at specific events in which larger historical dynamics in women's history at Berkeley become visible. Uh, we chose six years at 25 year intervals mm. to serve as the high points of an overall narrative of Berkeley women's 150 year history. The series, um, which is in progress, it is, it is not finished, gives a way to explore and synthesize and present the historical literature that's already been written on women at Berkeley. Um, the chancellor just said that, what, that one of the big changes in university history over the last 150 years has been the enormous uh, growth in the participation of women, especially in positions of responsibility mm -hmm. over the last 50 years. But the large comprehensive histories of the university were written before that change began to occur. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we want to do now is to take this anniversary as an opportunity to write the history of the last 50 years of change, but also the background to that in these, um, in these watershed year uh, essays. So out of that look, our attempt to sort of take six high points and make a sketch of the overall history of, women's, of women at Berkeley, several large patterns have emerged, but I, can only, I only have time for one, which is that the university educated women have been essential, this is important, they've been essential and not incidental to the state of California's development. Mm -hmm. 150 years. Um, their importance is probably easiest to see in the university's early years. Whole institution actually might have foundered if they had not admitted women students. So we sort of think of, of, the, uh, of uh, the regents as doing something generous for women. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, they, they were being magnanimous, yes, but the university desperately needed educated women. By admitting women, the university secured its own supply of high school teachers mm. who could create new students for the university. At the time, we have to remember, there, were only a, uh, there was only a handful of high schools in the state mm -hmm. that they could prepare students well enough to start doing university work. Mm -hmm. Women high school teachers at a very high caliber, um, the university probably would not have uh, found its um, its customers, so to speak, for quite for, for for quite a while. And that kind of pattern of women providing, especially educated uh, women providing the um, what we might think of as the social services groundwork for a modern state, that kind of pattern is reflected over and over again in these watershed years. I think it is so interesting and important that many of these early um, graduates become teachers. <laughs> and I, I'm thinking about how um, and why um, um, the education of these teachers becomes so crucial to the foundation of, of California, you know, K through 12 schooling. I, I just think that we oftentimes miss those kinds of connections. So I'm so appreciative that the, that the project pulled that out. Yeah, I think it really is super important because we do forget that the university rests on the top of a vast pyramid of mm -hmm and that the two things are utterly interdependent. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Humphreys, um, what did you find in terms of some of the most pleasant surprises from this project? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, the whole project has been a great education for me and I have found it extremely pleasant to read about the history of the university and then to read Many, many of the works that have been written about women. Um, Kathy just mentioned the interdependence of the high schools and the university. And mm -hmm. so <clears throat> it was a pleasure to rediscover Professor Geraldine Clifford's marvelous book about the early years and the training of teachers and the issues that Kathy just discussed uh, equally in view. And I hope that she, Catherine, Professor Clifford may be even watching this show. Mm -hmm. um, but a not so pleasant discovery or very interesting discovery, I would say, is the, um, the way in which the early women students were not necessarily, uh, although admitted equally, not necessarily treated equally. They, were, um, they had no space on campus in which to gather. They, had the commu they didn't have dormitories on the campus. It, uh, they had to, many of them had to commute or live in boarding houses, which were unsanitary. Um, they, they, had, they were not, um, they formed their own association of women students because they didn't feel they had a strong enough voice in the original ASUC. Mm -hmm. um, and even more serious is that President Wheeler, as late as 1904, questioned the purpose of their education by saying you are not here to be he, to become old maids or teachers you are here to improve to learn how to be good wives and mothers and to advance purity something of that sort so um, the women students quite late were receiving a mixed message and even the renowned um, professor of english charles mills gailey who was a fabulous um, teacher, did not had some classes in which women were not permitted to join the men or he held separate sections. So that to me was a fascinating discovery having attended Smith College, a college for women where the aspirations of women, the educational aspirations were never questioned because there were no comparisons and no inequities on that side. But um, I'd like to talk um, maybe later in the hour about the incredibly delightful outpouring by departments and units 
who cre have created these histories to date, the ones that you mentioned, 25 or 26, but we have another 12 in progress. And so for me, the generosity of time and thought and effort on the part of the people who created them, many of whom are staff members, um, for whom this was a task on top of their regular job, and emeriti faculty who've taken the lead, and um, students, we have some students involved, so I, I can give, give greater detail later, but for me, that's been the incredibly delightful surprise. You know, the earlier part of your um, response totally spoke to me in terms of how it's so hard to live in the sea of patriarchy and not get wet by it. And clearly <laughs> our early female students got wet by the waves of patriarchy in terms of the expectations of what they were supposed to do with their degree. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's interesting also, and I'm curious about, about how many women at this time are we talking about? At, the, at UC Berkeley, when we talk about the early composite of these women where they are, are forced to seek um, housing off campus, about what, num what, are, what do the numbers look like? Well, if there were eight students who entered, and as Kathy can tell you, we have memorized the percentage of 46% of women by the turn of the century, more than in an, any co-educational institution in the whole country. And we, were, we benefited from the fact that Stanford decided in the 1890s to limit the number of women to 500. Wow. So 46% and then soon, and that's a very healthy percentage. And so when did the percentage and the numbers, um, when did they begin to diversify? That is, when do we begin to see um, um, female students of color added to UC Berkeley's population? Well, that, I will just jump in quickly and then Kathy and Carol, you can add, but the, um, the first black student was a male. He started in engineering, but he didn't graduate, uh, Alexander Jones. But the first female um, black student was Vivian Rogers and she graduated in 1909. So she is thought to be the first black undergraduate student. Um, by 1922, there were 17 black students on campus, um, of whom eight were women. And we know this because of the picture that has, is in Kathy's um, narratives and is on our website and has been featured um, of the sorority that was founded by um, Ida Jackson. And so I will stop there, but um, they were a very small fraction of the campus and um, People are now taking an interest in these eight w black women students. My colleague, Gia White, for example, is writing an essay, which will eventually go up, we hope on our website about those eight women students. Um, Ivan Natividad, the campus, uh, campus reporter has written a detailed article about Annie Coker, who was the first um, woman to pass the, black woman to pass the bar in California. Um, and she was a part of that group. She's in that picture. Um, Vivian Osborne, who was an activist in Berkeley and so forth. So these stories are not well known mm -hmm. and m people are beginning to investigate them, um, which is just fabulous. You know, when you were talking and you were talking about pictures and images, I immediately thought about the power of visual culture okay. and how, you know, oftentimes visual culture becomes a way in which to fill in the traditional archive. And so I was wondering if, if one of you could kind of, kind of elaborate on the importance of photographs in this project. Kathy, do you want to take that one? Or, or <laughs> well, shall I, mean, I jump I, in? I, I'm not at all a, um, an expert on the, uh, on the archive, uh, on the photographic archive or in general, the visual archive that uh, the university holds. I know it's been tremendously uh, helpful to us to be able to use it. Mm -hmm. I, I hope actually that as this project goes on, there will be much more cataloging and detailing of how much of that archive is really, um, is really relevant to women. I think one thing that happened it, even in the um, 
even in the uh, yearbooks, which were not only not always <laughs> kind to women in their presentation of women, is, mm-hmm. is a lot of visual recording of what women are doing, even if there isn't a mm-hmm. lot. Um, of, of other kinds of recording of women's activities on campus. So um, we know, for example, that uh, um, as women's sports began to take off, there's a pretty good uh, uh, archival record of those sports, even though they were not considered to be at all as important as men's sports to say, mm-hmm. or on in the Daily Cal. Mm-hmm. So it has been really very important to us. Yeah, I might add to what Kathy just said. I, one of the things that was most moving to me mm-hmm. in meeting with, this was more than a year ago, with a group of Black student organizations that call themselves the Triad, is they talked in uh, these really um, uh, passionate terms about what it felt like to walk through Sproul um, mm-hmm. Hall, where there are lots of pictures of the history mm-hmm. of the university mm-hmm. and see just white men in those pictures. Mm-hmm. So I think it's so important that we change the public art and representation mm-hmm. to show the diversity of our history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am okay. Oh, sorry. No, please go ahead, Sheila. Well, I was just, I was going to add two points to those that Kathy and Carol made. Uh, one is that an aspect of this project was um, the production of some very handsome banner, photographic banners Mm -hmm. of important women, both current and women of the past. The first set of nine banners was hung on campus before the shutdown occurred. The second hasn't yet been, um, hasn't been hung, but will Mm -hmm. be in the future, but we will put these um, very uh, handsome photographs on our website. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just give some credit to the Bancroft Library, which has Um, been extremely generous throughout the project and has a vast archive of photographs um, which have been useful and will be useful for scholars forever. You know, those Bancroft images and Professor Gallagher's mentioning of yearbooks, talk about a wonderful visual canon that can be utilized in the future for all kinds of projects. So I'm so, so very glad that this project utilized these resources and also, you know, um, make them more accessible for other people. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna kind of fast forward a little bit and kind of shift to the mid 1970s because it's during this time period when the gender composition of our faculty began to change And I'm wondering, Professor Gallagher, if you could talk about this changing composition of the faculty and what you think actually ignited this change. Um, Well, I think that first of all, of course, there were all of those that that all those interdependent changes going on in the late 1960s and early 1970s um, that were pervasive. They operated everywhere. Um, There was the there was the birth control pill, <laughs> generally second wave feminism. There was civil rights and there was civil rights law. And there was civil rights law on which um, anti-discrimination in sex law, uh, out of which anti-discrimination in sex laws also um, came. So there were all of those changes. There was, uh, there was just a, a general change in women's consciousness, much greater uh, career ambition, much greater academic ambition. And all of that also led to a more kind of robust pipeline Hmm. for for women faculty all over the country. There were, and I could talk about this uh, for a a little while, there were um, also lots of support groups for women faculty. Campuses were a great place for women to go to get, to experience solidarity with each other. Mm -hmm. A lot of feedback was a lot of feedback and synergy on the part of female graduate students and campuses, um, lots of interdisciplinary work going on. It was the time when Black studies uh, departments, when ethnic studies departments were extremely active as well. 
So all of that sort of came together in a generalized um, kind of upsurge from below of, uh, of interest in academic life as a possible career. Um, but there were a few things that happened specifically at Berkeley that I think we should also mention because the ambitions of women had to be met to some extent by the willingness of universities mm. have the kinds of uh, hiring and promotion procedures that would actually allow them to be hired and advanced in their careers. And at Berkeley, especially there were some things that are specific to the institution that were important. There was a group of faculty women called the Women's Faculty Group mm. that um, did a study of the faculty at, the, at Berkeley, which uh, became really quite famous. It was an academic Senate report on uh, the status of academic women. And it has to be said, first of all, that this that 1968-69, when this happened, was a low point in the number of women who were uh, on the regular faculty. Mm -hmm. And then uh, up to almost 10% in 1939, it had fallen to 3.6% mm -hmm. in 1968. Mm -hmm. So that's a really steep, uh, mm -hmm. that's a really steep drop. Mm -hmm. this, uh, small group of women faculty asked the academic senate to take on the question of why that happened. Mm -hmm. The women themselves were on the committee. Uh, one of them, uh, happened to be a, a, a great uh, a statistician. And, um, and, uh, and what, the, uh, what that committee showed was that there were certain uh, procedures in the university's own hiring and, and, um, and promotions process that were standing in the way and thwarting women's academic careers. So that's one of the things that happened at Berkeley. And that particular report uh, was given to the press and it got a lot of um, publicity and it was shared throughout, uh, throughout the country. So that then uh, led, as a matter of fact, to, a, um, to a, a, a lawsuit several years later mm -hmm. against uh, the University of California, a class action lawsuit. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, this is again in 1968-69, a national group of women called the Women's Equity Action League also um, brought a, an action against many universities mm -hmm. across the country, complaining that none of them had adopted as they were supposed to and implemented affirmative action programs mm -hmm. to uh, help guard against sex discrimination. Mm -hmm. So that was another route through which universities were feeling a lot of pressure on this issue. And, you know, long story short, um, the federal government did in fact uh, take some actions against various universities, one of them, the University of California and the university entered into negotiations over affirmative action procedures. Mm -hmm. Did lead to a lot of our rules, current rules for monitoring of hiring and um, promotions to prevent uh, discriminatory outcomes. So, um, so all of that was going on. I know that's way too long an answer, but some of it is just was going on everywhere. Some of it was specific to Berkeley. Um, it was a time of tremendous, uh, let's say, action on this particular issue. That is the issue of increasing the number of women faculty, um, and it, it uh, and it was successful. I actually don't think it was a way too long answer. As a historian, my heart is leaping with joy that you contextualize how women faculty at Berkeley not only were situated within 
the history, but we're also able to take advantage of the historical moment and the historical legal possibilities connected to affirmative action. Because oftentimes we only think about affirmative action in terms of race, but the fact of the matter is, you know, white women were heavily discriminated against and were able to seize and take advantage of affirmative action law. And we see this with the expansion of the women faculty. So I am pleased as punch that you contextualize the history of mm -hmm. women here at Cal. Um, and, and Chancellor um, um, Chris, you were one of those early faculty women. And, and I'm curious, what was it like to be a female faculty person at Berkeley? It, it, um, when I joined the Berkeley faculty in 1970, the faculty was 3% women. Uh, and 3%, um, you know, is a very small percentage. It means in any group of 100, there are three of you. So you certainly felt um, uh, a, a, as if you were um, both uh, very visible and invisible at the same time. Um, but the, the, the thing, thinking back to those years, that was also... Um, also characteristic of them is there was so much um, activism among that 3% women. Um, the women on the faculty were closely bonded together. They welcomed other women. And there was a very activist agenda on a committee for the status of women of the academic senate. I remember, you know, early on in my faculty career becoming a member of that committee. Mm -hmm. And we had these t-shirts made Mm. that we called the Zero Club. And on the back were the names of the departments that had no women in them. Mm -hmm. But so there was a really, really active um, organizing and advocacy mm -hmm. on the part of women, even though there were relatively few of us. Um, so I, I see it as a, as, a, as a time that was quite effective in the way in which women faculty were, um, were organizing and, and advocating for uh, um, a greater presence of women on the faculty. I love the fact that you all were organizing and found collective strength amongst each other. And of course, I absolutely am excited and love the whole idea of creating a t-shirt because we oftentimes think about, you know, paraphernalia as, as something that's like a contemporary way of expressing an idea or an allegiance. And the fact that you all had on these shirts, the Zero Club, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it speaks to the power of, of paraphernalia, um, uh, material, material culture mm -hmm. um, 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 during the early 70s. Um, as a group of women, 3% of, 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 of the campus population, where were you all largely located? That is, which departments um, um, were a part of the Zero Club? Well, the Zero Club was, um, <laughs> there was the membership in the sciences <laughs> and in engineering and, and women were, there were more women in, um, in the uh, social sciences, the arts and the humanities and the professional mm -hmm. schools, particularly the, um, what I think of as the social service professional mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. where, is where most of, the, most of the women were. But they were really also, you know, pioneers, um, uh, uh, women that played an extraordinarily important role. This is a little bit later. This is the 1980s when, when we had a two provost system. Um, Doris Calloway, who was a chemist, but was in the Department of Nutritional Sciences, which is where women chemists often were located, um, was the provost of the professional schools and colleges, an enormously important figure for the history of women at Berkeley. And is it during the 80s, late 80s and early 90s, when we begin to see even diversity among the women faculty? Yes. 
that's certainly uh, that's certainly the case. Um, I, Barbara Christian, an mm -hmm. extraordinary woman, um, just uh, and um, and Margaret Wilkerson, um, again another extraordinary woman. I mean, it was it was in the eighties and nineties that we started seeing more um, diversity of of race and ethnicity among the women faculty. Mm -hmm. I have to say, Professor Margaret Wilkerson was the chair of the Department of African American Studies when I was hired, oh. and I count Barbara Christian as one of my early colleagues. So in many ways, I benefited from that transition. That is, when I came into the Department of African American Studies, Margaret Wilkerson was the chair, Barbara Christian was there, June Jordan was there, Bebe Clark was there. So in many ways, I was able to, in the early 90s, take full advantage of the campus stretching in a particular way. Did the campus need to do more? Absolutely. But the fact of the matter is, I was able to benefit in African American studies from these um, female um, colleagues. Um, I wanna move yeah. a little bit faster because as always, time is chipping away from us. Mm -hmm. um, Professor uh, Gallagher, this question is either Professor Gallagher or Dr. Humphreys, whomever feels like they feel like they wanna jump in. And that is, can you, either of you um, talk about your favorite person mm -hmm. that you learned about um, during the project? And more importantly, why did that person become special to you? Mm -hmm. Do you want to start or would you like me to? I, I, you go ahead, Sheila. Okay. Well, there are so many. I, it's very, very hard to say who my favorite is. And um, <clears throat> the early women in STEM are, are very important. Agnes Faye Morgan, who was one of those chemists who was um, hired in nutrition and then turned uh, she, uh, hired in home economics actually and mm -hmm. spent her career trying to change uh, the name of that department from home economics to nutrition but she was exceedingly successful in uh, focusing her research on human nutrition animal nutrition all kinds of discoveries um, and eventually was received one of the highest honors from the campus, the faculty research lecture, an honor which Catherine Gallagher has also received, I might add. Um, and you mentioned Elizabeth Scott, who was the co-author of the report, um, which had national implications. But let me just jump to the person um, to whom you introduced me, Eula. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite person is um, Louise Alone Thompson Patterson, mm -hmm. who was a black student graduating in this famous uh, era of 17 black students on campus. She graduated in 1923, cum laude in economics with a major, minor in Spanish. And she embarked after her graduation on a lifelong, lifelong career of social activism in the name of social justice. A few quick highlights. Well, let me back up by saying the way we were introduced um, to Louise Patterson um, is that Louise's daughter, an alumna of Berkeley, Dr. Mary Louise Patterson came out and gave a talk sponsored by African American Studies in 150W about her mother on March 4th. It was one of the last events before the campus shut down mm -hmm. to a room packed with students. Um, and the, the career of Louise Patterson um, stretched from her involvement in the Harlem Renaissance, her lifelong friendship with Langston Hughes. She worked for Zora Neale Hurston. She led a group of black intellectuals and artists to Russia in 1932, where they were meant to make a film um, sponsored by the Communist Party to show the oppression of blacks in America. Um, she was very active. It, the film didn't happen, but she was very active in the Communist Party. She went to Spain during the time of the Spanish Civil War. Um, she was active her whole life. Very, she was a brilliant organizer. And she was the chairman of the New York Committee to Free Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. And she returned to the Berkeley campus to receive the Fannie Lou Hamer Award in 1991 at the Black Graduation sitting on the stage with Margaret Wilkerson, mm -hmm. Barbara Christian, mm -hmm. June Jordan, and probably Veve Clark. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that she said was that 
history offers us a guide to action. Mm -hmm. And um, she also said that an ignorance of historical truth is a weapon of racism. So mm -hmm. she affirmed our purpose here, which is to bring facts and untold stories to light. So that's why she's my favorite person. And thank you, Eula, for allowing us to um, join African-American studies and bringing her to the attention of our students. Hmm. Absolutely. Professor Gallagher, would you like to add? Um, yeah, I think probably, you know, favorite is, a, is, a, uh, is one of those things, um, one of those words that, that grandmothers and <laughs> parents of all kinds kind of, kind of shy away from. But <laughs> I, I think one of the people I, I, who, to me, really deserves mentioning here is uh, Jessica uh, Peixoto, who was actually Berkeley's first faculty woman. Mm -hmm. she, um, uh, she, she was from a San Francisco family. Her father did not want her, didn't think it was seemly for a woman to study at a university and take a degree. So a lot of her education was done via, um, via tutors. But finally, her father did let her go to the university and, she, and, and when she was a, a fully uh, mature woman. So she really came to Berkeley as a mature student in her late 20s. Um, and what astonishes me about Peixoto is the way in which she bridges the Victorian and the modern eras. Mm -hmm. She lets us see a number of things that are typical about women um, at the university and the kinds of roles that university women, again, sort of uh, filled in the state at large. Um, she had astonishing persistence and creativity. She was in uh, economics department in a specialty that she in fact invented, which was social economics. Um, she studied basically, uh, she sp studied for most of her life the problems of poverty, but also the problems of household economy. She was very interested in looking sort of at the micro level of what individual households did. Mm -hmm how that affected the larger economy and how they could or could not take advantage of opportunities in the larger economy. She had, um, she, she, she even studied academic families. To mm -hmm. see how they, she was interested both in, in, in production and consumption mm -hmm. of the household. So she did the very first studies of how academics uh, made their money and how they spent their money and what their own economics was like. She was an amazing mentor to all of the women on the faculty who oh. came after her. Mm -hmm. uh, she built an institution inside the economics department that some of her male colleagues derisively called the female wing mm. economics by which they met the wing of economics that was interested in poor people and mm -hmm. how to um, and how to solve the problem of poverty wow. uh, in the country. So, you know, all those traits are just exemplary. And in addition, you can see again, how a Berkeley women's faculty program uh, helped develop the modern state. Mm -hmm. Basically mm -hmm. what those women in that program did was to take something that had always been women's strength, which was something like charity, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, and turn it into, professionalize it, mm -hmm. and build it into the state apparatus. The social welfare, especially family welfare and child welfare, these are things that Peixoto, Peixoto really um, uh, pioneered for California. So I just think she's an, an immensely mm -hmm. important woman. Wow. She was. You know, it's interesting because I'm hoping that both of these personalities, right, um, become part of the digital archive of this project. Oh, yeah. and, I, and, and I was thinking at this time, Chancellor Chris, if you could talk about um, how the digital archive and how all of this work will be preserved and maintained moving forward. 
Well, thanks very much, Eula, for that question. I've been thinking a lot about it, and I hope that we can have something like um, a, a, an even more comprehensive uh, archive, sort of like a Wikipedia for the history of the mm. university. It's striking for um, an institution of such historical significance um, mm. of how relatively little, especially recent historical scholarship there is. And I was talking before um, about the, this group of um, uh, African-American Black student organizations, the triad. One of the things they felt most urgently is make our history visible. Mm -hmm. And so I think we really have a responsibility to who we are now, as well as to our history, mm -hmm. to find some permanent way of creating not just the archive for um, 150 years of women, mm -hmm. but really an archive um, for the campus that makes visible and accessible mm -hmm. um, the diversity of our of our history. I, this this project has been really extraordinary. It's it it. Um, I, I, first of all, the, the leadership was, um, it was the brainchild of Sharon Inkelis and um, faculty member, um, my faculty assistant for, um, for sexual violence and sexual harassment, and Oliver O'Reilly, mm -hmm. uh, the, then, the then chair of the Academic Senate. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think there's just been extraordinary participation and leadership on Kathy and Sheila's part, but it, it just shows how, you know, these stories are uh, there's an urgency about their being told and all the departments that are coming forward and all the individuals that are coming forward shows what a wealth of um, both interest and um, urgency there is about telling in a more organized and accessible way the, this part of, of Berkeley's history. Thank you for that, because in many ways, I mean, given social media, you know, um, um, the importance of digitizing archives, you know, will allow, you know, people all over the world to have access um, to the wealth of knowledge that has been produced by this project. Um, Dr. Humphreys, I want to talk a little bit or have you talk a little bit about the lessons of the project in that, you know, how can the project, what did you learn and how can the project help us move forward as a campus? Well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I think that what I learned was by collecting the histories, many histories, existing histories of departments last fall as a prelude to approaching departments to create, to reflect on the histories of the women in their departments, that despite the fact that there are many um, detailed histories of departments, that women were not mentioned very often, if at all. I would say uh, Lincoln Constance's long history of botany is one exception because so many women got degrees in botany but were not hired as faculty. They had other kinds of positions as research assistants, for example. Um, but I, I think the lesson is one that um, Chancellor Chris just said, there's an immediate need to bring these stories, um, to make them visible, mm -hmm. because they empower the students of today. They, the consciousness of the past, I think, gives the students resilience, especially since when you read these departmental histories, you see what kinds of obstacles the women, early women faculty and graduate students overcame. It's tremendously inspiring and empowering. So I, I, that's what I learned. And I learned a lot of things that I didn't know before, but my hope is that this will, that these lines of inquiry will persist in the future and there will be a great deal more history not only of the campus, but of women and of underrepresented groups. Um, as you say, the students are clamoring for it. I had a conversation yesterday with a group of honor students in the Prytneon, and I was, they went through their majors and they had never heard of Agnes Faye Morgan, they'd never heard of Elizabeth Scott, they'd never heard of, they hadn't heard of very many of the people whom we've highlighted on, on our archive. So um, that's, that's my answer. Okay. 
Well, um, my last question for all of us, and I really want you to take your time with this, and that is, it's a futuristic question about the next 150 years. Um, and I'm wondering, what do you hope, what are your aspirations um, in the future for persons who identify as women at Berkeley? And maybe if each of you could take a little time with that question in terms of what you hope to see um, in the future. You will, maybe while we're taking our time thinking about that thoughtfully, um, this is a, an, an answer that doesn't require much thought, but I would feel very um, irresponsible if I didn't share with you some mention of all of the different groups who have contributed to the history that is in our archive. Sure. Carol Christ said in her an invitation to us, please crowdsource this history. Mm -hmm. And crowdsourcing we have done. Um, there has been the, for one, the one group I'd like to mention is the Emeriti. The Emeriti have sponsored undergraduate research projects, which are now on our website. Um, the Center for Studies in Higher Education has digitized all of the chronicles mm -hmm. of the University of California, including this, the special volume about women, ladies, blue and gold, mm -hmm. and the nine volumes of the chapters. Um, the Prittany and alumni have come forth and voluntarily are uh, writing biographies of no, no fewer than 300 Brittany wow. and alumni as their contribution to our project. Wow. Um, the uh, Alumni Association itself just published an entire issue of their California magazine in fall with a splendid timeline and many juicy articles inside um, illum illuminating very, the women in the pandemic and law mm -hmm. professor Eleanor Swift. Um, and so I just want to say that um, in addition to all of these departments, which have created these histories, we've had a lot of other people, a lot of other um, groups who've just come forth. Um, the Japanese American um, Alumni Club of UC Berkeley uh, gave us, uh, offered an essay by a member of the class of 1952 in which she um, interviewed classmates who were sent to um, internment camps. And that's on our page. So I, I, it's, been, it's been very gratifying um, that, in fact, I think there, there has been, momentum has grown. We've had male allies. Uh, David Hollinger wrote an essay. Jessica Bishoto was beautifully written about by the former Dean of Social Work, Jeffrey Edelson. And this all contributes to the tapestry of, of history that, that will reside in this archive. Very nice. I love the fact that so many people were inspired to participate. Yes. I, in many ways, it gets at the need for the project, how people were waiting for the project. Mm -hmm. And, and, and hopefully, um, going back to the last question, um, all of those entities will help the project move forward. Mm -hmm. And so how can we or you imagine bringing all persons um, who identify um, um, as women to participate in the future of this project? There are, um, I, we still have a lot of progress we need to make. I mean, there is um, still not the kind of representation of women in um, uh, on the faculty in some STEM disciplines that I'd certainly like to see. Although I was thrilled that Berkeley's first um, Nobel Prize uh, won by a woman was uh, was uh, the, uh, just last week. Um, there are is enormous progress to be made um, in recruiting. Um, under underrepresented uh, faculty members to Berkeley. A phrase I use a lot is equity of experience. I think that demographics aren't enough. Berkeley is now m more than 50% of its undergraduate population as women, but there are still parts of the university in which women are underrepresented 
in undergraduate programs in computer science, for example, or certain parts of engineering. So um, I, I, we want a faculty that is even more diverse, more inclusive, and um, students who never feel like any part of the university is not one in which they belong. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Professor Gallagher, would you like to add anything? I'm, I'm glad that you um, mentioned uh, people who identify as women, because I think that it's important for us to realize that sexuality does have a history. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest changes in the history of sexuality has come um, in the last couple of decades where more people are making self-conscious choices mm -hmm. about um, what they want not just their gender identity to be, but also sometimes their, their physical sexuality. I think the university has so far done a pretty good job of making sure that, with, that uh, people on campus are, uh, are al allowed to um, put themselves in the, ca in the categories that they themselves have defined. And that's mm -hmm. very important. It does seem to me that the history of sexuality is very much open-ended. Uh, I, I would like to just go back though to a point that um, that came up earlier. This So this is more near future and even uh, very near future that I'm thinking about. And I've been um, wondering what the university can do uh, to um, encourage uh, equal opportunities in the state of California for all families to get the kind of education that would prepare them for the university. Mm -hmm. um, Carol and I were talking earlier because we've both been in the room with our grandchildren um, in public school situations where uh, when the pandemic came um, and the schools shut down, we see a tremendous uh, dis uh, disproportion racially and economically in who actually has the ability to mm -hmm. get an education from home right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that the university should really be spending a lot of time with. It's a question of uh, families and educational opportunity so that the university can have the kind of future we want it to have. Well, you know, I think that is a wonderful way to put closure on our conversation. Mm -hmm. That is, we are a university that cares about student, faculty, and staff here on campus, but we are also a university that is deeply committed to our surrounding communities in the state of California. So thank you so much for participating in this conversation. Um, and I wanna thank you on behalf of all of the persons who will benefit in the future from the material that has been compiled around this project. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Yula. Thank you.